And just between 2020 into 2021, um, we've hit our highest number in a year yet for deaths, and that was around 90,000. So the opioid crisis is just, just uh, a perfect storm of worse, worse proportions that has really um, hurt so many, not just with addiction, but also overdoses and all the many problems that come with those struggles. It's like, whoa, I'm in a lot of pain. Like I fall and have an autoimmune disorder. I got like, I'm, there's a reason I need these painkillers. And at the moment it's the difference between being in chronic pain and not sleeping. And then depending on a pain medication later that I'm going to have to get off of because they're dependence forming. And some of them say, look, for whatever reason, I can't manage this on my own. So I'll be on this medication and the analogy and medically, this is not the right analogy, but um, metaphorically um, insulin might be the right analogy. You know, it's just a medication you need to take every day. Um, other people do get off. But it's usually, unless you've been uh, had a drug problem for a short period of time, you typically have to be on these uh, replacement medications for a while. And the reason is because it takes a long time to repair your life. Welcome to the Michaela Peterson Podcast, episode 127. In this episode, Sally Sattel and Peter Pishka joined me for a conversation about dependence forming medications the opioid crisis in America and their connection to the system for prescription meds in the U S this episode was close to my heart because I had chronic pain for 10 years, ankle replacement, hip replacement, arthritis, and getting pain medication was very difficult in a very dangerous way. This is one of those topics I think everyone should be aware of. Sally is a psychiatrist and addiction medicine writer. She's a lecturer at Yale school of medicine and the author of PCMD, how political correctness is corrupting medicine. More recently, she co-authored Brainwashed, the seductive appeal of mindless neuroscience. Her articles have been published in the New York Times, the New Republic, and the Wall Street Journal. Peter's a journalist focused on health and disability issues. He hosts the Happy Warrior podcast and has appeared on many top podcasts and TV shows. One of his most famous articles is titled A Painful Struggle, Opioids Can Be Dangerous, But Restrictions or a Ban Are Worse. As a journalist who struggled with chronic pain himself, he aims to inform people about far-reaching issues like the opioid epidemic, our main focus in this episode. If you enjoy this or at least learn something, please remember to hit subscribe. Sally Sattel and Peter Pischke, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Uh, before we get started, can I get you guys to give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Let's start with Peter. Hi. Well, it's great to be here on the podcast. Thank you for having me on. Uh, my name is Peter Pischke. Uh, I am a health journal and disability reporter. I write and speak a lot on the issues of the opioid crisis, um, medical ethics. I talk a lot about the issues facing disabled Americans and, of course, chronic pain patients. That's really where I found a lot of success talking about what's happening with uh, pain patients, but you know, all other patients that require pain uh, medicine, such as you know, someone with a cancer or a terminal illness, um, and speak into the issues of their concerns, in particular, what I refer to as the prescription opioid prohibition and how that affects uh, so many millions and has created a situation that is so much harder than it already was. And the opioid crisis is already an extremely difficult thing. I also do um, my own podcast, Substack, The Happy Warrior, and uh, I'm just really uh, glad to be here today. Thank you. Sweet. Okay. Sally. Hi, I'm a psychiatrist, and um, I'm also a resident uh, fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C., and I've worked, um, seems forever, in methadone clinics where uh, by definition, uh, folks who come in there have uh, a problem with opioids. Um, in inner cities, it's mainly heroin. I, I worked for a year in a small town in Ohio and there um, pills were a bigger problem, although even at that time, which was 2018, there was already a transition to heroin and fentanyl, even methamphetamine was coming in there. But so, hmm. so that's my um, <clears throat> credentials for knowing about opioids. And in the course of studying the opioid crisis, I study many, many things, but that's one of them. And, um, and I became aware as well of the uh, 
problems facing chronic pain patients because we've just uh, swung the pendulum so far in the other direction about being afraid of painkillers, which can literally be lifesavers, that that's created yet another problem. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I wanted to bring you guys on here because I've got, I would say, extent, an extensive background in painkillers from having my hip and ankle replaced and just having arthritis. I've been on opiates a number of times and gotten off of them and experienced withdrawal, but I've also experienced what happened to my life when I wasn't able to get painkillers fast enough, which led to being suicidal fairly quickly because I couldn't sleep. So I wanted to bring you guys on to give the audience a bit of a background on, I wouldn't say, I don't want to say like the benefits of painkillers, but why they're necessary for some people, especially people living in chronic pain, the dangers associated with taking them or with not being able to get them. But um, where, where do we want to start? Can, can you guys give a brief background about what happened to start this opioid crisis? Um, I guess uh, if that's okay with uh, Sally, I'll start there. So uh, the opioid crisis, uh, there are several arguments about where it's beginning, but the most common one or side one is that following uh, most 20th century, which was uh, basically anti-opioid, there's something called opioid phobia. You can see this in old TV shows and movies. In the 1990s, things started to change. There was a bigger emphasis on trying to get uh, pain care to more people and that in total pain care in many places. And sometimes that was taken too far. In the 1990s, we had the invention of OxyContin, which was uh, a pain medication, opioid. And it was um, its use was to be for long-term chronic pain because you need to stretch it out across your day. So there is more medicine in it. Um, the company that put it out, Purdue, they heavily mismarketed the drug. They made claims about that just weren't true, and the drug reps sold it incredibly hard. At the same time, we had the federal government who was pushing very heavily for a, a, a policy we would later call the fifth vital sign, which was we have to, for our individual patient, we have to get complete and total control of their pain. We're going to take doctors and we're going to put their metrics against how much pain they can get on top of. So they, they went from very little painkillers for people that really need it to too many painkillers for everybody. And there was some irresponsibility there. There is some argument that Americans have drug problems before this. We can, we'll definitely get into that. But anyhow, that kind of got the, the addiction side of it, especially in places like Sally uh, worked in, in Ohio, industrial places of the country where you have people working heavy, intensive labor jobs. So they have a higher rate of uh, injury and they need some kind of painkiller to get on with their life. And uh, we were seeing issues sometimes where it was sometimes referred to as hillbilly heroin. They could take this drug, OxyContin, and it could kind of be like heroin on the cheap. They would mix it with water, become gel-like, they put it in and inject. Um, and that was a major problem. The, the deaths part, though, that's the part, that's when people noticed this issue going on. Didn't really get going until 2011 when the uh, U.S. government, uh, the Obama administration, stepped in and required Purdue to reformulate the OxyContin so it couldn't be turned into that gel-like substance. And by doing that, they took all these people who are using a relatively safe supply drug, though unwisely, and they, they pushed them to black market drugs and much more dangerous substances. And then as that got going, um, illicit fentanyl, which in the normal medical setting is an incredible drug that uh, makes surgery and all kinds of amazing modern medical miracles possible. But uh, as an illicit drug, is extremely dangerous. It is very, very potent. And so all of a sudden we have these people who are casually using these drugs and struggling with addiction and we push them on to um, lethal substances. And that's kind of what got all the deaths going. Um, 500,000 or so over the last decade. And just between 2020 into 2021, um, we've hit our highest number in a year yet for deaths. And that was around 90,000. So the opioid crisis is just, just uh, a perfect storm of worse, worse proportions that has really um, hurt so many, not just with addiction, but also overdoses and all the many problems that come with those struggles. Okay. So you said 90,000 deaths between 2020 and 2021? Yeah. From 2019. So you go into 20 and then 2020 into 2021. Yeah. Okay. And how far above that, does that have anything to do with the pandemic? 
and an increase in an in opiate deaths from like maybe depression? It's a little hard. So definitely the pandemic does feed it some, but we are already seeing a high uptick in the, uh, the number of deaths before the pandemic started. Um, mm-hmm. So the pandemic definitely played a part, but it's hard to, pe- it's hard to like to take these strands and tear them apart and tell totally which is which, but they were both definitely a heavy factor. And the strategies that we've used so far to try to deal with the opioid crisis, um, when it comes how the heavy, heavy handedness to pain patients and others has not worked. In fact, there are many studies that just came out this year, this summer, even that show that when we take people who are reliant on opioid pain medications and we force taper them, we take them off the medications against their will, it pushes them into a, a spiral, a very dangerous situation. What you yourself talked about and myself, I went through back in 2018 when I was uh, forcibly removed from my medications from a physician that I trusted. Um, that can be a very dangerous situation for patients. And that has only fed into the amount of overdose deaths and the deaths of despair. It's a horrible, horrible situation. Just awful. Okay. Um, Do you mind touching on what happened to you, what you went through? Yeah, that's fine. Um, So I I'm a full-time disabled person. Uh, 14 years ago, this October, uh, just this month, um, I came down with chronic pancreatitis um, that has developed in some other health issues. And I was reliant on Tramadol and Oxycontin to be able to meet my pain needs wasn't the most effective, wasn't the, wasn't the super best, but it did its job. I was able to go and get my bachelor's and later my master's. I was um, active in my local area. I ran for school board one year. That was an interesting experience. So I had a somewhat active life, you know, a pretty good, pretty good compared to many. And then unfortunately, um, the push against opioids had finally caught up with my town here in South Dakota, my physician pushed, put me aside one day and she says, look, I only have two patients left on opioids. It's you and this gal with MS. And I, I like you guys, but I don't necessarily think this is really good for you. And so I'm trying to get all my patients off of opioids. And there was a little bit of victim blaming and a little bit of like, I want to protect my license. You know, <laughs> I'm doing this for my own good as much as yours. Uh, but it was, a, it was a very heavy thing. At the time I was teaching public school and I remember getting off the phone after trying to talk them through this and make my case and just feeling like, I just don't know how I'm going to go on. Do I just do I, is suicide the option now, Pete? It was a very dark situation. Um, thank God, you know, I was, um, the Lord really uh, held my hand and helped me get through that. And now my, my health difficulties, well, only many of them have gotten worse because of that untreated pain issue, but I still have tramble from another physician I was able to find. So I'm luckier than most. And I fell into this journalism thing again, which I went to school for. So I've had a pretty, pretty good situation compared to many people, but the many people I've talked to personally, either through my reporting or advocacy or just friends and family, I mean, they can take things that maybe you would, someone else would think that's a relatively little thing. Like someone gets a knee surgery, a knee replacement surgery, and you know, they're just, it's just a knee replacement surgery. Like, why aren't you snapping out of it? but the untreated pain gets out of control and it can take over their lives. And you can take someone that has an issue with pain medicine. You could relatively give them a full, normal, active life. And you push them on essentially to disabled one. And that is, that's such a common story that is all over the place. Um, And it's, it's a wide range of people that required on pain medication, either for short-term situations like a surgery, sometimes for long-term and the most disturbing is in it's with a terminal illness. And even though many people, many people know that doctors know that this is ethically wrong, they also know their hospital system or the state medical board might come down on them. And so they have to make uh, a, a hard decision when you're dealing with someone that might, you know, have metastasizing third stage lung cancer. And you're like, they'll, they'll literally say this. And I've heard this so many times and it's almost, it's really hard to believe. They'll say things like, I don't want to get you addicted. And <laughs> it's like, my mom is in her eighties. She's dying from lung cancer. This is not this is not a concern of ours right now, Doc. But unfortunately, um, dark humor. Sorry for laughing. No, unfortunately, what, that is a, a common story I've heard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, m- my experience, I guess, with opiates is so I needed my hip and ankle replaced, and I started not being able to sleep. So because I, I couldn't put my hip in a in a position, I was seventeen. Couldn't put my hip in a position that didn't hurt enough that I stopped sleeping. And I went to my rheumatologist and 
she said, have you tried ibuprofen? And I was like, at that point I was basically walking on broken bones. And I was like, yeah, we've tried ibuprofen. Like I can't sleep. And she'd had a bad experience with a previous patient, a kid who had gone on opiates and hadn't gotten off of them easily. And so she just stopped prescribing them. So she referred us to a pain clinic and the wait, wait, wait time was six weeks. And at that point I was considering suicide because of the pain. And so that was when I first got clued in to, it's like, whoa, I'm in a lot of pain. Like I fall on have an autoimmune disorder. I got like, I'm, there's a reason I need these painkillers. And at the moment it's the difference between being in chronic pain and not sleeping. And then depending on a pain medication later that I'm going to have to get off of because they're dependence forming, but you have to weigh the costs and benefits. And I feel like society's kind of gone in this direction where it's like, oh, if you have an addiction or a dependence on something, that is the worst thing that can happen. Even if the alternative is, you know, living in chronic pain, which is completely unacceptable. Sally, what, what kind of people did you see, um, in methadone clinics when you were working there? Like, did, was it a wide range or was it a specific subset of people? What did it look like? Yeah. Oh, I still work there. Um, well, these are always in their city, uh, mainly Washington, DC. And there you see largely what I call old school addicts. Um, these are um, in inner cities, they tend to be um, black uh, men and women. Uh, the average age in our clinic is 57. Uh, they started using a long time ago when heroin was weaker. Um, a lot of them start mm. with injecting because it was weaker. Um, you know, many of them have had HIV and hepatitis C and um, you know, we occasionally get some young people uh, who tend to be more white and uh, they've, the story with them is they've often tried buprenorphine, suboxone, and while it helps a lot of people, it just didn't help them. And that's why they came to methadone because the trend now is to refer um, uh, people who are, you know, first coming in for an opioid problem to, uh, excuse me, to put them on suboxone, which is uh, unlike methadone, I guess I should explain, you know, methadone has been around since the 60s, and it's what's called it, um, an opioid replacement. It is an opioid. It's, it's synthetic. Um, and uh, and it, it really it takes the place of the heroin or take the place of the oxycodone or um, whatever opioid you're on. Uh, buprenorphine is a medication that um, doesn't completely, it's complicated medication, doesn't completely um, replace uh, it, it, let me just say that at lower doses, it's more of a replacement and higher doses, um, it, it gets, um, it doesn't function that way. But um, at higher doses, in other words, one becomes, um, you know, more tolerant to its effects. So that's a built-in protection to overdose. And because of that, uh, the uh, federal government has allowed physicians to prescribe it out of their office. Whereas for methadone, you must come to a federally registered methadone clinic. The methadone itself probably costs two cents a day, but there's um, the cost of running the clinics. It's pretty high because you have to have so much protection. It's investigated and um, um, supervised by the DEA and also um, the SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. So it's easier to go to a doctor and get buprenorphine the um, mm. problem is that um, a lot of um, primary care doctors, and I have to say, I do not blame them because they haven't been trained. Um, and that's, you hear this story a lot. People will go to a primary care doctor. Uh, understandably, it's very hard to get into a, a pain clinic. And sometimes you don't know you need a pain clinic because you're at the early stages of a pain condition. And, um, but doctors are, uh, you know, they're in their private office. And they're not in, in sort of ensconced in a methadone clinic with counselors and, um, you know, a literal plan, you know, a literal place where we sometimes have even uh, folks, you know, security, they're not dressed as security, but, you know, these places can get a little rough sometimes. They're, they're in their office with patients uh, who are uh, drug problems. They haven't been taught in medical school or residency how to treat them. There are uh, lots of myths about um, uh, folks who are addicted. Uh, which is to say that, that they'll rip you off um, or they'll, they'll scare the other patients at the clinic because they're unkempt or they might smell bad. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, that can happen. But a lot of folks um, who, who uh, 
younger people especially have probably started buprenorphine on the street. So by the time they come in, would come into a primary care um, doctor, they're already kind of stable and they just want the doctor to prescribe it legitimately. And, th and those would be easier patients, plus they should be referred to counseling as well. Um, so, so there's a, almost in a way two different cultures of um, uh, medicating folks. There's the methadone clinic, um, we have counselors, they're, they're excellent. We have group therapy. People are on these medications for a while. Some are on it, frankly, their whole life. And those are people who have tried to get off it, um, you know, relapsed and uh, gone back into a, you know, hellscape of addiction and then come back to the clinic and then they think they could try it again. And some of them say, look, for whatever reason, I can't manage this on my own. So I'll be on this medication and the analogy, and medically, this is not the right analogy, but um, metaphorically, um, insulin might be the right analogy. You know, it's just a medication you need to take every day. Um, other people do get off, but it's usually, unless you've been, uh, had a drug problem for a short period of time, you typically have to be on these uh, replacement medications for a while. And the reason is because it takes a long time to repair your life. Um, people use drugs for reasons. Um, I won't prolong, talk too long on it, about this, but I think one of the uh, misunderstandings is that uh, people sort of just get addicted as in the accidental addict. I've heard that phrase and I think it's very useful, which is to say you go to a doctor and he gives you some Percocet for a toothache. And I will certainly agree that doctors have been far too generous in the old days with these medications to give you a month worth. You really only need two days worth. Um, that's a big problem. Those pills often got diverted, but, um, but the, it, it is not common for people to get addicted to, to pain medication that they're prescribed. And there are conditions under which that happens. There's no question. Typically people with histories of addiction or current problems with anxiety or depression, those folks are at risk doesn't mean the doctor shouldn't prescribe it, but he has to be very aware of those risks and some don't ask. Um, but, you know, the myth is that, you know, folk, I think we're going to see this on the Hulu uh, show, honestly, uh, called Dope Sick. Um, it mm -hmm. cycles so many of the myths about opioid addiction, uh, which is that everyone's at great risk from getting um, Percocet or Oxycontin from their doctor. And, and they're just not. But that myth led to this, this uh, radical, radical um, retrenchment on prescribing that was a machete and not a scalpel. And, um, and it's caused awful problems for people. And um, I guess I'll just finally say that, that, that one of the many um, factors that uh, you know, gets lost in all this is when you look at the overdoses that, that have Oxycontin or uh, it will oxycodone, they won't have the brand in it. You know, of course it will have uh, hydrocodone, oxycodone, um, uh, the parody and other things like that, but um, fentanyl, uh, usually not medical fentanyl. This is illicit fentanyl. Um, these deaths have benzos, uh, Valium type drugs, yeah. Xanax. People rarely, uh, when you look at the autopsies, it's rarely a single drug problem. Yeah. One of the comments I want to make on that. So I did a lot of research because my dad became dependent on benzodiazepines and it was a, it almost killed him. It was a complete disaster. Uh, but when I did research and I was looking into overdoses specifically, opiate overdoses specifically, uh, most of the overdoses, if not all of the overdoses I've seen weren't actually just opiates, which is interesting because in mainstream media, you see, oh, opiate overdose or something like that. But most of those people are also on benzodiazepines or some sort of psych alcohol. med, but alcohol. Yeah. So that's very interesting, um, which is something I didn't know. So in the States for prescribing, say you're in chronic pain and you go to a doctor, are they not allowed to prescribe something like Oxycontin anymore or Oxycodone? Like how are, do you have to be referred to a pain clinic? How does it work in the States? Um, unfortunately, it's a situation where there's just enough regulation that it makes it very difficult for a prescriber to take on that burden. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's left undefined enough. So it's left in the ethers. It's not really well answered. The CDC really pushed this heavily with the, the opioid prohibition of things with the 2016 CDC guidelines, which was an attempt, if you're putting in, a, if you're looking at it the best light, was trying to provide guidance for 
um, your your general gen, your basic general practitioner about when or when not to prescribe opioids to people. Unfortunately, the states, especially state medical boards, the hospital systems, they took the CDC guidelines, and the CDC had never previously had an opinion on the, this issue because they're the CDC. That's not their deal. That's the FDA's deal. Yeah. Uh, but so people took it seriously as law. And in so many states, there are 36 states, I think, now that have laws based on their guidelines about the arbitrary 90 MME threshold, which is morphine milligram equivalent. So that's a topic unto itself. But no, often there isn't a law that says you're not allowed to prescribe this. What happens is, and I'll give you a fantastic example, Dr. Roger Cho, who is a, a pretty, uh, he seems like a decent uh, doctor and scientist. He's the one that was a main primary author on the 2016 CDC guidelines. There was a meeting, what was it, maybe last year, the end of 2019, where the CC is meeting and he talks about his experiences. And he says, you know, I have my patients, they come in, they need to prescribe a pain medicine. So I prescribe them a pain medication. I then receive a letter from my state medical board and hospital system that says, you cannot prescribe this many medicines to this person because of the, the, the 2016 CC guidelines. And then they'll cite a paper and it will have his name on it. And, and, wow. and you, see, you see situations like that all the time. It, it often, it doesn't have to be, you need enough formal legislation so you can't do this. It's enough for your hospital system to be aware that this is the way things are going. And this is what expected. They'll keep an eye on you. It's enough that your local law enforcement, or even sometimes federal law enforcement, like DEA is putting pressure on physicians or the hospital systems. And you of course have the state medical boards. They don't want to cause any problems. And it's, it's, it's this perfect storm of uh, disincentive, disincentives. At the same time, we are pushing all the, you know, if I, by the way, Michaela, sorry, so sorry for the stuff that you and your dad went through. I remember particularly with your dad, how cruel and just grossly unfair many people were being. I mean, that's typical, I guess, of the news and social media these days, but they, they don't understand. Part of the problem is, is that we've taken all these patients. You say you, we can't trust you with pain medications. If you want to get some kind of pain care, you have to go to a pain specialist. And so what happens is, oh, then, okay, so all these patients, they move over to the pain specialist. Maybe they were on a, a painkiller. So then they're put on some other kind of drug like gabapentin, um, yeah. uh, maybe an antidepressant, a benzodiazepine. And uh, two things happen when they do this. The first is that the, 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 the law enforcement and others look at them and say, hey, this guy has a much higher level of prescribing. Well, of course he does. You've taken all the high-risk patients. You gave them to him. And the second is, as patients are pushed from one medication to another, eventually that other medication gets targeted as well. And you, so you end up with situations like in the UK with the NICE guidelines where they're like, yeah, you can't really use anything for pain, not even paracetamol, uh, you know, like Tylenol. Um, you could maybe do antidepressants and talk therapy. What? And that, well, because based on their reasoning, those are the only things that have straight evidence. The other stuff is too risky, but it's a crazy situation. If you have any experience dealing with me, those, those strategies really work in a desperate situation. So it, it, it's crazy. We've created a situation that's, that's up in the air enough that no one really wants to answer for it. And patients are left to lurch. And if you've ever been to your physician trying to figure out a problem, you go to visit, to visit, to visit, and you do the tests. And eventually you come to a point where there are no more tests you can get. There are no more answers. And then, so then your physician is like, and you're just kind of like, <laughs> left in the air. Well, it's kind of like that. For so many patients, their inability to get their pain treated seriously is an issue of, unfortunately, uh, medical or moral apathy. It's, it's awful. It's a terrible situation for so many. And uh, who knows how long this thing is going to go on. Yeah. Well, yeah, you mentioned, um, Peter, the 2016 guidelines from the CDC and, you know, if you look at them, they were intended for primary care docs, and it was called, you know, high-dose opioid prescribing, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but, you know, intended for primary care docs. And some may quibble, but I think the guidelines really weren't that bad. I mean, they had some basic good information, which is if you, if you are going to use opioids, so the assumption right there is that they have some value, um, you have to start at a low dose, or you should. They're guidelines. They don't have the force of law. Start low, and the, the phrase is go slow. So if you do have to raise the dose, you know, do it slowly. Um, 
and some other points that, that were clinically valid, I thought, and they accept for this, this threshold of 90 morphine milligram equivalents. So what does that mean? So what was yeah. that threshold? That was per day? Yes. Yeah. You're kidding me. No. Um, for chronic. Yeah. Okay. So that would be 90 milligrams of morphine or like 60 milligrams of Percocet. That would be the conversion. And then as, as Peter alluded to, that's a whole nother issue because one MME for me is not one MME for yeah. you. Yeah. Your metabolism is different. Uh, your psychology is different. So, um, and unfortunately, and this is, should be a real lesson, never put numbers in guidelines because people just grasp them uh, and never let go. So this 90 milligram, morphine milligram, yeah. Well, became almost, you know, um, like it was handed down from Mount Sinai. And uh, some doctors felt they had to stay uh, at that dose, which for, you know, people without a chronic pain, so there's probably enough. But, you know, there are folks with chronic pain who need hundreds of um, milligrams or MMEs, I should say. And um, so they were either taken down to 90 or ripped off altogether, tapered. Uh, some doctors tried to do it slowly. Others, uh, like uh, Peter mentioned, or uh, will often mention that they're afraid of, for their license. And frankly, they often have good reason because the DEA can be so aggressive. And um, even when the docs are doing the perfectly right thing. So there's been untold suffering. There's a term called pain refugee of people who travel um, literally across the state and across the country sometimes to find a pain doctor who will, yeah. Them. And they, those pain doctors, as you mentioned now are, are blinking, uh, you know, red lights on the DEA's uh, dashboard because they end up dealing with the most difficult patients who need the highest doses with the most intractable pain. And um, it's getting more difficult and more difficult. The CDC is now reformulating those guidelines, but um, uh, a source tells me it doesn't look very promising. They don't seem to be changing it very much. We'll see. We'll see. They're not approved yet, and it could be that they'll go back to the drawing board and it'll be more enlightened, but it's a terrible problem, um, and a lot of it's due to the media, I would say, the way they've misrepresented the nature of this addiction. Yeah. It's a tricky situation because I, from my experience with being on a, I was on so many medications for so long. I'm not on anything anymore. Thank God. But I was on a lot. And my experience was that the psychiatric medications I was on were far more harmful. Like, um, I, for when I had my hip and ankle replaced, I was on Oxycontin way more than 90 mil, like MMEs equivalent. I think at one point it was 240 milligrams a day. Mm -hmm. But I got up there and doctors aren't informed that, like you said, people metabolize things differently. So you can have rapid metabolizers. So then the medication wears off faster for some people than it does for other people. So I had the issue of Oxycontin every 12 hours, but it wore off at seven hours. Okay. So I was in withdrawal. So then I had oxycodone to cover the withdrawal. So eventually that was changed to three times a day, but it was just bouncing in and out of withdrawal throughout the day being covered by other pain medications. So I think People just don't know what they're doing in regards to pharmaceuticals in general. And it's nice that they're kind of maybe becoming more aware of the dangers of psychiatric medications, but rather than just focusing on specific medications that are more dangerous, it's like, oh, all of them, which puts painkillers on the list. And then like you guys are talking about screws over people who are in chronic pain. And when you're experiencing chronic pain, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. You don't like, you don't care, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to have an addiction. Did that, maybe I won't want to die as much. Like <laughs> the, the upside is so dramatic that talking to somebody dealing with severe chronic pain about whether or not they're going to become dependent on something is kind of a joke. Yeah. I have a colleague and I'm happy to connect your listeners. If anyone's interested, he's at the university of Alabama and he's trying to do uh, kind of the first um, ob objective or highly quantitative study of people who have been tapered and frankly have either thought seriously about suicide or have followed through. Uh, there are a lot of anecdotes, but Ooh. nothing systematic. And he's trying to uh, study them. So uh, maybe I could give um, his contact information and you put it in the show notes or something. Yeah, sure. I'll stick that in the show notes. Yeah, that's a good study. That's that's a risk. Yeah, I think you're referring, is that Dr. Kersetz or Kersetz? Yes, I can never pronounce his name. Yeah. Yeah. 
no, he's a, he's a, he's a fantastic. I mean, he's a good scientist. He's also a really nice guy. All my interactions have been extremely positive. Uh, you know, part of the problem with all this is, you know, some of this doesn't even have to do directly with pain care. Some of this is the pressure when we, you know, with, a, with Obamacare and the move to push to more um, electronic health records, we put a lot more pressure on doctors for their time use. And when they have to see so many patients during the day and they have to fill out so many forms and put in information, they need shortcuts to help figure out prescribing decisions. Well, when they do that, they, they will rely on something called, and you can look this up, um, from Wired, Maya Solovitz has an amazing, just an incredible article on this, on uh, PDMPs and things like Narxcare. And these are electronic programs that are supposed to do um, these algorithms. And we don't know actually what's in the algorithms. We can't uh, check. But these algorithms will determine if someone is at high risk or not of abusing an opioid. And they will make decisions on this. What we do know on things that are completely arbitrary. If you are a disabled patient, you maybe use multiple pharmacies or go to multiple physicians. Well, in this PDMP, that will be a, a, a point against you. And so often when uh, these physicians have to make a, they have, they have little time, they have to make a gut check. Maybe this is the first time they met this patient and they have to make a decision. Is this worth the risk? Can I trust this person? Well, if you're in the mm -hmm. ER, especially, I mean, I love ER docs, but they're crazy cynical because they see some of the worst of humanity. It's, it's hard to make that decision. I have an uncle who's an amazing guy and he works at a nursing home. Unfortunately, because he works at a nursing home and because of his medical history, he's never broken the law. He's never abused drugs. He was broke when he, when he went to his doctors, like you have to come in, you have to do this. And they brought him in because they wanted to chew him out because they suspected him of abusing drugs. Now there was no evidence of said behavior, no history of it, but the, the, these electronic algorithms were like, eh, maybe there might be, maybe this is something you should take a look at. And, and those are some of the more issues Yikes. that, that take a lot of the, uh, the autonomy away from that special provider patient relationship. Uh, and they're just, I mean, we could be here hours talking about all the issues, but those, those are some of the big things that popped in my mind. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, you're so sensitive to the pressures on doctors. Look, I don't prescribe pain meds. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, but um, but it, I mean, for every story in this situation, there's almost a, an opposite one. In other words, it is true that there are horror stories of doctors who they, frankly, I'm appalled because I can understand how a doctor who works in a system that believes, you know, has decided the CDC guidelines says everybody has to be down by 90%. I can see how they feel compelled to do it, but some do it much more sympathetically than others. They try to help the person find a pain clinic. Um, they, they, uh, as I said, do it slowly. Uh, they, they tell them they, they're so sorry they have to do this. And others have frankly seem pretty insensitive. So I guess for almost every story, there's another one. Doctors never have enough time with patients. And, um, and it is also true that patients sell their meds. Um, that, that's just true. And so the level of suspicion when you don't really have a chance to get to know your um, you know, the patient is, is kind of understandable. Plus, as I said, they're afraid the DEA is you know, hovering. So Boy, it is hard to find, um, overall, it's kind of hard to find villains. The system is awful. Um, but this, again, the CDC situation did not help. Um, one reason I'm a little pessimistic and I hate to be so is that, uh, frankly, Stefan Cortez and I and two other, uh, three other um, doctors, uh, one was a um, pharmacologist, wrote to the CDC um, in 2019, and we asked them to please clarify their guidelines because we knew they didn't mean that patients had to be ripped off their medications or that if they were stable on 400, whatever you were on, Michaela, 250 you know, milligrams of Oxycontin and doing well, or it was helping you leave you alone. Um, and they did, to their credit, within a month of that letter being sent to them, they uh, issued a press release saying, this is not what we meant. If patients are doing well, you mm. know, leave them alone. And then they published an article two weeks later in the New England Journal of Medicine to that effect. And we were so ecstatic. We put, we had a little, we were called HP3, health professionals for um, pain patients. And um, we have a website, but it only has that letter on it because we were devoted to that one issue. And uh, we posted it. We told every pain patient, show this to your doctor. And we got so many emails. I did show it to my doctor and he didn't care. Yeah. Uh, boy. 
Yeah, that's tricky. That's really tricky. It's like every time the CDC changes something too, do people read it? <laughs> like, does anybody read these things? I know for, uh, because I was like kind of embroiled in the whole benzodiazepine thing. That's a problem to say the least, but I know that they issued a black box warning last year, but nobody, I don't think primary care, primary physicians actually know about that stuff because they're so overworked and they have too many patients, like you said. So I don't know how the information actually gets down to anybody who's prescribing. Well, the irony is sometimes it is drug reps <laughs> and, um, and that is a, you know, part of, again, this, uh, the Oxycontin story, but um, you know, where they not, I'm sure not all of them, but, but some of them, you know, really did bend the, the truth. Um, it is true that a long acting medication and Oxycontin, the content means continuous, any long acting medication compared to its short acting equivalent is going to be less addictive because that's just the dynamics of, of pharmacology. The, the slower, an, uh, the slower um, a reinforcing substance gets to your brain, the less addictive potential it can have. Well, but I thought, but so- You can still I, get I, addicted, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was less, I thought it was more dependence forming though. No. Oh, that's not the experience I've had at all. Oh, interesting. Well- um, Yeah, or with, or with people on methadone. Um. Oh yeah. They're, they're both dependence farming. I know that with the shorter acting ones, you get more of the highs, right? right. And so the, get that more would quickly. contribute. And the yeah. More quickly, yeah. The more rewarding it is. Right. Yeah, for sure. I've just, I've talked to a lot of pain specialists about painkillers specifically. And from what I've been told, it's the ones that are super long acting because it stays at such a stable dose for a long time that people end up on for years. Cause it's so oh, I see what you're saying. Farming. Yes, it can be harder to get off them. Yes, that's why we take a year to get people off methadone. But that's also psychosocial because they they need to prepare for their, um, you know, as I said, it just takes a long time to become an addict. There are a lot of problems that preceded it that caused you to turn to drugs, and then you created a whole set of problems when you were addicted. So it's a lot to work on. Um, but but from a strict sort of medical uh, standpoint, yes, it takes a longer time. On the other hand, that makes it somehow self-tapering. So it comes out of your system, but it comes out more slowly. So that's all true. Um, uh, but I was gonna, uh, gee, I was gonna make my more point, I forgot, but carry on. <laughs> Do you guys, um, okay, so two comments, I guess. One, perhaps, because I'm thinking of solutions to this problem as much fun as it is talking about how problematic things are. Um, I know in Canada, if you're on painkillers, then you can get the pharmacy to give you a certain number of doses, like per day or per week. So maybe one of the solutions would be allowing physicians to give out some of these painkillers to people in chronic pain a little bit more easily and have the pharmacy monitor how many pills they get, something like that. Do they do that? Anything like that in the States? It's annoying, but I mean, it, if it allows people with chronic pain to have access to painkillers properly, it might be a solution. I admit my understanding of the workings of far, uh, like a pharmacy in different countries is limited. I am aware that Canada does have a lot more flexibility in certain areas when it comes to um, dealing with these substances, but I, hmm. my knowledge on that area is a little week. So I, I can't really speak much to it. I apologize. That's okay. Do you guys, do you, so what do you guys see in the future? Do you have solutions to the problems or suggestions for the government about how to, I guess, if we're looking at easing access to people who are really, really suffering, that would be, that's kind of what I'm looking to do just be, and only, I haven't seen the downsides as much as the downsides of being in chronic pain. So I haven't seen you know, people who shouldn't necessarily be on them, who are addicted to them. I've been more on the side of people who really need them and then can't have them. Yeah, yeah. Um, is it okay if I go first? I was what about to you? raise my hand. I was like, I don't know why I was doing that. I was like back in school. <laughs> um, uh, it seems to me in American culture, we sometimes can be, we're very hard headed people. And sometimes we are very monocausal in our thinking. Part of the problem is we have two populations of people with different needs um, that kind of, they kind of parallel to each other. You, you know, about 10% of the US population, and it's really hard to tell. So tell knows this stuff better than I do. 
um, struggle with drug addiction or using illicit drugs. And about, you know, as of 2019, about 30 million people were reliant on long-term pain opioid use. These are about populations relatively the same size. And part of the problem is that we have been trying to set these these groups and their needs against each other. It's this idea that, you know, we have to make it really hard on the patients, the pain patients, so we can save the addicts. And that strategy, it doesn't work. We've tried it. There's now so much evidence and statistics to show this, uh, this attempt to try to punish one population, save the other, will not work and will only make things worse. And we will only be able to figure out our ways out of this terrible mess when we tr are able to treat patients with their physicians um, as in independent relationships, meet the needs of those patients. Uh, as long as we stay in this mindset that we, we have to treat people like numbers and we have to uh, make decisions that are above them and their health and their physicians, we will struggle to get out of this. And, and addiction is such a difficult thing. And we have so many ideas we need to get past to try to try to deal with it. I mean, I'm not in favor of like everything in harm reduction, but, you know, there's a lot of ideas there that are worth exploring that what we've tried so far they don't have the best efficacy. I mean, 12 steps are cool. I've, I've had a friend that really struggled with addiction. So I've been through the 12 step program. It's helpful, but if you look at the statistics of its efficacy, it's, it's not very high. It's pretty low. And you know, it, even something like many branches, narcotics anonymous, they'll have something like, well, if you're using methadone to deal with your problem, if you're, you're getting a medicated assistant treatment to deal with your addiction, well, that's, that's a moral failing. So we have a lot of ideas and impulses in our culture and society. We, we're going to have to need to get past if we want to get on top of these things or just let the timer run out. I mean, this is what my friend Jacob saw and the guy at, at Reason has written, I mean, for 20 years about drugs and opioids. You know, his theorem was, okay, well, Ben, uh, at worst, we're going to be waiting 20 years because that's often how medical fads go. 10 years to go yeah. in, 10 yeah. years to go out. And at that point, maybe then people will allow to have payments again. But I mean, how many people will have suffered needlessly during that time on both sides of the issue? Yeah. 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 Well said. Do you, can I contribute my... Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I agree with everything you said. Um, I have four things, so I'll make them quick. Um, the first is that uh, medical students and residents just need far better education or education at all in, in, in pain management. Um, and, <clears throat> and pardon me, <clears throat> you know, one slightly uh, um, distressing fact about all this is um, true, doctors are under a lot of pressure. They always say, and it's true, it takes, it takes five minutes to prescribe Percocet and 30 minutes not to because people will, mm. you know, it becomes a struggle. And sometimes you're struggling with someone whose motivations maybe aren't so great. And other times with someone who desperately does need it. But the point is, it takes longer. Um, but this medication was Schedule two. You know, DEA has five schedules. One is heroin and LSD. Um, uh, drugs considered, and I emphasize considered, um, having no medical value. And then it goes to five, like codeine. And then uh, most of the medications we're talking about are schedule two. Well, that, that morphine is schedule two. I mean, I, I you know, come on docs. Uh, first off, you shouldn't be learning from drug reps, uh, but better education. That's number one. Number two is, uh, maybe I should speak for myself saying as a clinician, I'm not that much uh, bothered by, by a red flag here and there. In other words, if I were to practice in a way that might be, uh, you know, um, not a little unconventional, I don't mind somebody actually um, saying, oh, how are you, can you walk through your treatment, you know, in a curious and open-minded and, and uh, uh, way, you know, how is it that, how can you uh, explain that your, your patient is on this dose or on this medication? And then I say, well, we've tried everything else. And I read some case studies that show this can work and we're going to see it. And they go, oh, okay, fine. That makes it, if there was a history and this all takes time, but if there was a history of this kind of um, surveillance with a small S that was benign, I, I, you know, I think doctors would be less terrified of, of um, yeah. some kind of scrutiny. Number three out of four is, I mentioned the CDC, but for heaven's sakes, it, its initial guidelines had so much impact. Hopefully, 
a sensible revision would too. Um, and four is for people to realize we're not in the, um, and for politicians and, and authorities and um, I'm afraid to say even some docs to realize we're no longer in the pill phase of the opioid crisis. That was considered the first phase. And, and granted, it did set a lot of problems in motion. And then it was around 2010, heroin came in, and 2014, fentanyl. And fentanyl is what's killing almost everyone now who's dying. Um, people are using, uh, younger people are actually using opioids less, but the death rate is going up because fentanyl, which oh. times as potent as morphine, is what's killing people. Oh, I didn't know that. So no, you think we're, overall we're opioid... With... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so opioid use has gone down, but because of how strong fentanyl is, there are more accidental overdose. Are, is that a lot of yeah. fentanyl mixed with like something like cocaine or something? Some of it is. In fact, cocaine is not um, typically a, a particularly deadly drug. It could be a very destructive drug, you know, from, as we know from crack, but um, it's not that it's not known for its deadliness. Uh, but yes, it is true. Now it is more, far more risky because fentanyl is, is mixed in with it. Um, I, I even wrote in an article um, uh, that I think, and this, I know some people would find this very controversial, but now we're in a phase where it, we're coming into a phase where it could be the safest time to prescribe opioids because there's so much, um, there's so much attention being paid to, to, to doing it. And the fact that now hospitals do have more guidelines about how, how physicians should proceed. And um, so I think we, we could enter that phase, if, especially if the, med, if the education um, aspect of it is, is fulfilled in medical schools and residencies. Um, there are other medications certainly that can help. Physical therapy is underrated. It can really work when you stick with it. Um, other things, psychotherapy can matter. So not, not did your mother, you know, um, not that kind of historical psychotherapy, getting into old conflicts kind of thing, but how to a cognitive behavioral therapy because anxiety really makes pain so much worse. Point is there are other things and it could well be that, that a lot of people on high dose opioids today didn't have to be on that high a dose if these other interventions were implemented. That's all true. But once you're on the high dose and if it's working and you want to stay on it, to me, it's unconscionable that doctors would take you off. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I, you go ahead. Uh, we're probably getting near time to go, but I just wanted to add two things if that's okay. One, I definitely felt like needed to be said. The first is, um, yeah, if you're relying on um, any illicit drugs off the black market, you have to be extremely careful. Um, many people I know that still can persist in um, using, make sure they get a fentanyl test kit, which aren't legal in all 50 states. Yeah. But uh, I, it's a big enough problem. I have, a, I know two people um, in the media. One is a reporter down here in South Dakota. Another is Eric Bowling, whose kids died or overdosed from fentanyl, not because they oh. were taking a substance they thought was a drug to get high, but it was taking something like what they thought was Adderall. This is just some kid gives it to them. They think it's Adderall. Maybe they'll help them with their test. What they don't know is that it's been laced with wow. fentanyl and it takes them out. And that's unfortunately um, a, a terrible story that is in some cases common. The other thing is, you know, to pain patients or anyone that's listening, you know, that feels really hopeless right now. This is always my worry. Every time I talk or write about this stuff is, is that I'm, I'm pushing people down. Um, there is hope. I mean, Michaela here herself, you know, evidence of her, what I've been through, you know, you never know what's going to come up tomorrow. You never know what options are going to be in the future. Um, something, you know, something, one of these options that you try that you think might not work might actually help some. And, you know, this isn't going to be forever. And lastly, you know, it, it behooves us who are disabled people that we try to hold on. We need to have our story um, told for history, for the record for our families and friends. So to help society not to repeat this is because our lives are worth living. So I know the temptation for suicidality and self-harm is so high right now in the chronic pain community, high enough that I, there are many times and I've tried to talk about this and ask people, maybe not promote euthanasia. And there's like a ton of pushback. How could you say that? Um, really try, hold on, do your best. You know, I thought when I lost my medication, that was it, game over. But I didn't, I didn't uh, click the game over button. I continued on and things changed up. And I, while my life is a difficult one, it is much better than it was in 2018. And it's interesting. 
So there is hope. So if you are struggling with these issues or your loved one is, you know, please hold on. Um, things can get better. Uh, we can get through this. this. This craziness will not be forever. So just please hold on. Yes, that was good. I, I would say going back to what you said, um, that that a fentanyl mixed in with Ritalin or, or Adderall, that's scary. I didn't know that that was happening, mm-hmm. but it might be worth if people are listening or know of people who are, like you said, getting these black market drugs, having a naloxone kit, if they're available, yep, is definitely. also probably a good idea just to counteract potential overdoses. And that's, I, I don't I don't know about America, but in, in Canada, it's it's either $20 or it's free at it drugstores. It's free. So you can just have yeah. one in a cupboard somewhere just in case if you know of people who are doing that, because this fentanyl problem is a real problem. Yeah. Okay. Peter and Sally, let's start with Sally. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about what you do? Uh, Well, I have a website, which is sallysatelmd.com, sallysatelmd.com. And um, if people want to reach me through Twitter, it's S-L-S-A-T-E-L, S-L-S-A-T-E-L. Perfect. Peter? Oh, I'm, I'm freelance. I'm all over the place. Uh, you can usually find some of my own reporting at the Happy Warrior Substack. Um, you can also find my work. I, I'm pretty frequent um, and available on Twitter, which is at Happy Warrior P. Um, feel free to send me a line or if you have queries, question, questions, comments, just want to, someone uh, shoulder to cry on. Whatever. That's how we I, met. I've done it all. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, guys. Hopefully that shines a light on this opioid problem that we're experiencing and hopefully things get better but thank you both for coming on thank you for the opportunity no thank you this was great 